to do. And welcome to this webinar today on child protection in the EU internal and external affairs back to advocacy actions. My name is Evgenia Generalova and I'm communications and knowledge manager for Child Protection Hub based in Budapest with Terra de Zones. Okay, I can see someone is writing that it's clear. Can you please write in the chat if you can hear me well? In case you have any technical issues, we will try and help you. Okay. Yes, great, wonderful. So before we start, I will give you a very brief introduction to the platform in case for some of you it's the first time you're using Adobe Connect. And then I will introduce our speakers to you and then I will give the floor to them. So uh, as you have discovered, we have the chat box, which you should use for any questions or messages if you have any problems or any questions to the speaker or us organizers, please use the chat box. Uh, your microphones will be muted, so you cannot talk, you can only communicate in writing. Please pay attention to the polls. We will have a few polls on the screen, which we will ask you to answer. Uh, in case you have any problems with the sound, first of all, please check the green icon on the top black bar. There is an icon for a speaker, so it should be always green. And then next to it, you can see an icon of a man with a raised hand. You can use it to show your emotions, suggestions, to ask us to speak louder or quicker or any other suggestions. And now I will ask you to answer one poll, if you could have a look at it quickly and tell us how you learned about the webinar. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. And while you're answering, I would like to tell you a little bit about our speakers. So today we are going to have Olivia Lin and Rebecca O'Donnell. Uh, so Olivia is a human rights advocate who has been working in the field of children's rights and child protection for 20 years in Brussels. And Rebecca O'Donnell is an Irish lawyer who has been also working on EU law matters also in Brussels, and they are co-founders of Child Circle. It's a Brussels-based NGO focusing on child protection in EU law and policy. And they also work as independent experts with a wide range of stakeholders on strategic advocacy initiatives and regional projects in the field of EU justice and home affairs and EU external affairs policies. And uh, now I'm happy to give the floor to them. Uh, give us a minute to put the presentation and I hope you will enjoy the webinar. Thank you. So good morning everyone and welcome to this uh, webinar. We are really happy to be here today, Rebecca and I, and to speak to you about EU advocacy and uh, child protection. And uh, on the screen, in a minute or in a second, you will see our agenda for today. And I will start by giving you a brief introduction to uh, advocacy. And Rebecca will then take over and speak about the role of the EU and child protection and EU internal affairs. And I will then finish by talking a little bit about EU external affairs. And uh, uh, you've already ha heard that you can use the chat for comments or questions. And we hope to have a short Q&A at the end of the session. Uh, but without further delay, I will now start to speak about advocacy and I will turn off my camera in order not to distract you. So, what is advocacy? If you look at different definitions taken by some of the major actors in this field, 
you see many of these keywords, influence, stakeholders, evidence, knowledge, change, policy, legislation, practice, structures, and in our area, children's rights. And these are the key words that we take our starting point uh, in, from when we speak about advocacy. So influencing stakeholders, using evidence and knowledge to create change in policy, legislation, practice, structures for children's rights. And today we will particularly focus on children's rights to protection. So what are the key elements of advocacy? What do you really need to do to be successful? Well, you know, in my experience, and I've been working in advocacy for 20 years, I rarely see that advocacy is an ordered linear process where all of the right steps happen in the right order. We often operate in a somewhat chaotic environment and we need to be prepared to seize opportunities as they arise. And having a plan and a framework for your advocacy will help you to act on both unexpected events and expected events and being successful even when things feel chaotic. It will help you to quickly act on opportunities, target the right actors, build alliances and present convincing arguments at any given time. And today we will briefly look at some of these elements that we find helpful to consider when you go into EU advocacy. So what is the change you want to see? Who can make it happen? What can make it happen? And is your plan working? And we really do believe that considering these elements will help you prepare and be successful. So uh, let's begin with a poll just to see if you work with advocacy. Evgenia, would you like to open the poll? Thank you. So does your work involve influencing decision makers to make change for children? Okay, thank you very much. So I see that most of you actually do work with advocacy and you will probably be familiar with a lot of what we talk about today and you'll be very prepared to take in all our messages today. So thank you very much. And for those of you who rarely uh, or sometimes uh, work with advocacy, I hope that these sessions will help you to be better prepared when you want to take on EU as your advocacy target. So if we move to the next slide. So the first thing you want to do is to carefully define the change you want to see. So you begin with a problem analysis. What does your evidence say? Do you or others have strong evidence about, for example, practical problems, obstacles, rights violations, or underlying causes for violence against children. And why is there a problem? Are there gaps in legislation? Are there structural or institutional problems such as lack of collaboration? Is there a lack of resources? Once you've understand what the problem is and defined it carefully, you want to know what the issues are and define the needs, what needs to be done to address the problems. So what must stop? What must change? What are the alternative solutions? And what must be in place? Who should do that and by when? And once you know what the problem and the potential solutions are, you can move on to specifying your goals. And of course, it's always best if they are smart. That can be a challenge in and of itself, but do try to make them smart. <laughs> 
And here I really also want to emphasize that it's really helpful to only state problems. You have to be constructive in your advocacy and be very clear about what you think must happen. So the next thing for you to do is to figure out who can actually help you deliver the change you want to see. So my key message here is that it's really important not to make assumptions about who can create change. You really have to look carefully at who has the role, the mandate, the influence and resources that can help you create your change. And you have to remember that this can be several actors and they may change over time. So ask yourself, who has the power and mandate to help me achieve my objective? And who are the actors can help me influence those with key responsibility? Who can you build alliances with? And how can those who are neutral or undecided become your supporters? And in an EU context, this would mean asking yourself if the EU really has a role and mandate to play in the area you want to influence. And in that case, which policy area should you target and which actor? And can you build alliances? And I believe that as a network of child protection actors, you can build strong alliances on key issues of common interest in many different EU member states or neighboring countries. And you can together target decision makers in different places and throughout a process. So once you've found out who you need to target and build alliances with, it's much easier to see what the most strategic and appropriate action is for you to take. So ask yourself, what will have most impact? What will actually help change minds? generate new action or eventually change that law or provide more resources? Is it an information campaign to generate public support? Is it quiet diplomacy and bilateral meetings to share information and discuss strategic moves? Is it being a strong voice in public consultation? Is it producing a report and launching it with key policymakers and legislators? You also have to make sure that your action is relevant to decision making and legislative processes, to budgeting processes or opportunities such as political dialogue. What is the timing of a particular decision making process? When do you need to deliver in order not to miss opportunities? And are there specific opportunities, perhaps hidden, that you need to be aware of? So in an EU context, you might decide that you need to build stronger relations with your EU delegation to gain access so that you can keep an ongoing dialogue. Perhaps you want to work together with others to influence EU legislation by producing a policy paper with recommendations to the Commission. You might want to suggest amendments to a legislative proposal via an MEP. But always you want to carefully monitor your opportunities and we will speak much more about what opportunities exist in the EU context in our following presentation. Remember to carefully monitor opportunities, perhaps to take part in a public consultation or in civil society dialogue so that you're prepared to contribute with evidence based input. And finally, I strongly recommend that you carefully consider what resources you have for advocacy so that your plans are realistic. And the same thing if you want to work with others, make sure you know what resources those involved have before you plan and be clear about roles, responsibilities and deliverables. You really want to be targeted and limit action rather than not being able to deliver on expectations or act on a new opportunity that you might have generated or detected along the way. I think most of us who work in this field uh, recognize that achieving our goals and change for children demands a sustained long-term effort. And I suggest that you check in at different stages of your advocacy to see if your plan is working.
decide what you want to keep doing, what you want to change, or what you actually need to stop doing. For example, did that joint NGO letter to the 150 MEPs really work? Or had it been better to actually have a bilateral meeting with one influential MEP who could do the work from the inside and then send the letter? So taking small steps to evaluate your actions throughout the process and also look at the impact you have, it will pay off. Learn from what worked well and what went wrong. Build on previous achievements and address gaps that you have noticed. And make sure that you have a system for documenting action and outcomes. Um, knowledge management, dialogue and handover is crucial to ensure that your learnings are harnessed and communicated uh, with your team and those you pass the advocacy baton to. Because I know that we all often experience a lot of turnover in this field and it is really important that those who come after you know what was successful, what kind of impact there was and if there were any key other key learnings that they need to take into account in continuing advocacy. So with this very quick and uh, intense uh, introduction to advocacy, we will now start to look more closely at the role of the EU and the type of opportunities that exist in the area of child protection in both EU internal and external affairs. And if you do have any questions on my short presentation here, please use the chat box or save them for the Q&A uh, a bit later. Thank you very much. I'll hand over to Rebecca now. Hi, good morning from Brussels. Um, it's nice to see the, the group of participants and where you're all from. Um, again, I'll start with uh, the camera, but I'm going to turn off now so that we can go to the slides. Um, and I think we're going to start with a poll um, because we're going to start this session considering, you know, what does EU action, how do we advocate for EU action? And it, that means kind of thinking a little bit about what does the EU mean for you? So are you in an EU member state? Is it a candidate for EU membership? Um, are you in a neighboring um, country? Okay, so we can see from the poll that a lot of you are in an EU member state um, and someone very close to being in an EU member state, I hope. Um, and that's good for the purpose of my presentation because what I'm going to look at in particular is um, the role of the EU generally, but then focusing on the role of the EU in um, internal affairs. And that means what the EU can do within um, the EU uh, in particular. Thanks, Eugenia. So I will move on. Um, so this session is essentially to understand how the EU works and what does it do for children and then what are our entry points for EU advocacy, who do we need to talk to in Brussels, in the member states or if we're outside the member states, who, who what other actors do we need to talk about. Um, and when we think of children in the EU, or the EU and children rather, I mean, the EU can sometimes seem very remote, um, both from children and from national policy debates on children. Um, and to many of us at national level, the EU can feel like it's about big institutional actors working in Brussels, primarily on economic issues. Um, but child rights advocates have worked long and hard to support the EU in the role it can play in changing the lives of children. Um, and in particular on protecting children. Um, the EU can bring powerful resources to our work with children at national level, not always in terms of hard law, though sometimes, uh, but also through softer measures and practical support. And when we think of EU entry points, of course EU work does happen in Brussels, but the EU is a collective of its member states and of its national MEPs 
And so it's usually vital to create support at national level to get things onto the EU agenda. Um, and national NGOs and other stakeholders, professionals in um, member states can play an important role in doing, doing that. And that's what we're going, to, we're going to take a look at today. And just to say, it was in 2009 that the Treaty of Lisbon uh, brought this new article into play um, in the European Union. Um, and it provides that the EU shall do a lot of things, and that includes protecting the rights of the child. That's both inside the EU and um, within the world as a whole. So we can see that it's still young in a way. E the EU role in this area is still young. And that can be a challenge and an opportunity for all of us. Now, key question, what should happen at EU level and what should happen at national level? Um, and a major thing to fix in our minds is, of course, that EU, the EU can only act where it has been given the power to act by the member states in the treaties. And it has different competences. It has different ways of acting in different fields. Sometimes it has the exclusive right to act and the member states can no longer act. And we can take as an example setting tariffs at the external border. Uh, more often, it has shared competence with member states. And that, as an example, is the area of asylum and migration. The EU can do certain things. Um, and member states retain um, the ability uh, also uh, to take action. And sometimes EU action only complements what member states does, or the EU can coordinate kind of softer policies. And that's in particular in the area of education and youth, which is also of interest to us. Now, where the EU shares competence with member states, its action is guided by two principles. Um, the principle of subsidiarity says that the EU can act where it can achieve things that member states cannot. So there we can think of issues surrounding how, how the internal market works, how free movement works, um, cross-border links. There the EU clearly has a role and it acts. Um, the second principle uh, is proportionality. And it, this is simply that the EU should only do what is necessary to achieve those ends. And those are important principles to keep in mind whenever we think about what we want to ask the EU to do. We should only ask the EU to do things it can do, to act in fields where it can act, and to act in the way that it can do so. And we also need to remember that EU measures and national measures sometimes interact. So we need to look at the whole picture when we think about um, the EU. And there on the slide we can see some cornerstones of EU action that's relevant to children's lives. We mentioned free movement. Think of families moving across Europe as people work in different member states. Um, the internal market, uh, goods uh, flowing around Europe. We can think of uh, certain issues around product regulation and children's safety, justice. There, there are lots of um, EU laws concerning child victims of crime um, and most recently children who have been accused or who are suspects of crime. Um, asylum and immigration, of course, this is a key issue at EU um, level and national level these days, and we'll come back to it. Um, and health, education and youth, as I had um, mentioned. Um, and we look at some of the these areas specifically in a moment. But first, um, let's think a little bit about what kind of roles does the EU play? Uh, what does it do? Now, on this slide, we can see both what it can do in its internal affairs and what it can do in its external affairs. And Olivia is going to look at the external uh, actions of the EU in a moment. So I'm going to, again, zoom in on um, the internal uh, area. And basically, the EU can enact law. It builds a common legal framework within the EU in the areas where it can act. Um, 
it also sets strategic policy orientations um, around the region. And those, its strategies will set out priorities for action. It'll show where there's political commitment to act at EU level. An example of a strategic um, policy was the EU agenda for children's rights, uh, which has recently expired, but which had set out quite a, an ambitious agenda uh, focusing on um, EU action for children. EU is also involved in practical guidance and exchange of experience. Um, and one of the things that we see very clearly is that member states really learn from each other's experiences and um, looking over each other's shoulders and, and seeing what uh, is happening in other states shows that we face kind of common challenges or we can borrow innovations. Um, so all of that exchange of experience can take place both in meetings in Brussels, through meetings of the agencies, um, and uh, in some areas these are uh, these can create real achievements by generating guidance documents. For example, the Fundamental Rights Agency had expert meetings um, bringing together uh, actors from across Europe and created guidance on guardians for children deprived of um, uh, the parental environment. Um, there are, of course, agencies, EU agencies, that are operational. Um, and we see that of course, through Europol, the cooperation between the law enforcement authorities, um, through EASO, which is the European Asylum Support Office located in Malta, um, which is very active in the hotspots um, around Greece and Italy. Um, also, of course, uh, I mentioned the Fundamental Rights Agency. And then there's Frontex, the EU agency um, dealing with borders. Um, the EU is also involved in building knowledge about um, issues across the region. Um, so there we see research and studies. And of course, it also funds practical projects, um, usually regional projects, where actors from a number of countries come together uh, to address an issue. So let's now look at the areas of um, or the internal EU policies that might affect child protection. Um, and Looking across that, of course, we've internet safety. Um, the EU has a digital um, strategy, which is all about opening up digital opportunities um, to the citizens, making every um, individual, individual a digital individual, as it were. Um, and that, of course, also concerns and focuses children on the internet. Uh, Cross-border parental disputes, um, again, with free movement, uh, we see increasingly families moving together, but potentially one parent moving back to a, another country. Um, and the EU has laws which uh, govern which court will decide on a cross-border dispute between parents about custody of a child or in the case of an abduction. Um, how does another court enforce uh, a judgment made in another state? And interestingly enough, um, obviously, a ground for not enforcing the judgment from another state is if that court, the court in the other state, did not listen to the views of the child. Um, trafficking, um, there are laws, there is also an EU anti-trafficking strategy, and that emphasised that to combat trafficking and to respond to trafficking of children, you really needed to focus on the child protection system as a whole and strengthening it. And that strategy was very important in um, bringing a focus onto child protection systems uh, within the Commission. Um, and that led to the adoption um, or the creation by the Commission of a reflection paper on integrated child protection systems. And I really urge you to look at that if you haven't had the chance to do so. It basically sets out 10 principles for these integrated um, systems. Um, um, one of the um, principles really focuses on you know, multidisciplinary processes and interagency collaboration, which of course has been a focus of um, the Child Protection Hub's work um, and conferences in, in recent times. Um, and again, moving quickly on sexual abuse, there is a, um, a directive at EU level which um, uh, creates obligations on member states um, to put in place a child sensitive procedures in court uh, 
allows for cameras in court, tries to avoid um, secondary victimization of children who've been abused um, by uh, particular rules on how um, evidence is gathered. Um, and then child poverty is an area where the EU really has that complementary role I spoke about earlier. Um, and in that area, they've uh, adopted recommendations on investing in children. Um, the, and that deals with kind of early uh, prevention all the way up the chain, also to kind of labor market interventions. Um, and it's a means for member states to talk with each other about policies in the area. Um, and for stakeholders to talk with each other in the area. Um, juvenile justice, um, I have mentioned. Um, asylum and migration, the European Union has essentially put in place a common European asylum system, um, which uh, is under review, um, as you can imagine, at, in the current situation. Um, so there is very important legislation being discussed at EU level in that area. Um, but also, as I mentioned uh, already, the EU agencies are very active in um, uh, both operationally and also in terms of producing guidance. For example, the European Asylum Support Office has produced uh, guidance on age assessment procedures for um, determining the age of uh, an unaccompanied child without papers. Um, FRA uh, had the guidance on guardianship and EASO is looking across um, how to fulfill the best interests of the child across the different phases in the asylum um, claim. Um, and hotlines for missing children, I mentioned that because of course the EU has funded um, the hotlines for missing children for, for many years and is very active in promoting the use of um, hotlines both nationally and um, across borders. So Thinking about those areas, um, this is a, a point where we were going to have a poll. Um, in what ways do you think you can contribute to EU action? We'll, we'll come back to where the input should go, but let, um, Evgenia, if you could bring up the poll. Um, do you see your role kind of largely in kind of generating knowledge from the data and research you undertake? Um, contributing to consultations on policy and law. I mean, sometimes these consultations are less visible. Um, and then technical expertise, which really is kind of contributing to the FRA expert uh, meetings, and of course, carrying out projects. Okay, that's that's a very interesting result. So obviously, a lot of people are involved in in, in sharing sharing knowledge and experience. Um, and probably consultation on policy and law is, is deriving from those studies. Yeah, good, very interesting. Let's look now um, at a, a few examples, and I've mentioned some of them, of what the EU is doing um, in, in child protection. What are its activities? Um, and again, if we think of data and research, um, a number of years ago, the EU engaged in a study into child begging um, and its links with trafficking and its more uh, general setting. Um, so the Commission has also um, engaged in a study of children in justice uh, in the judicial proceedings, both criminal and civil, uh, throughout Europe. Um, and these studies allow um, comparisons to be drawn um, between the member states and um, common challenges to be identified. Um, there also are studies coming out from the Fundamental Rights Agency um, and other agencies. I mentioned there uh, probably one that is less well known, a Europol intelligence notification on children involved in petty crime. So there's a whole field of data and research at regional level. I spoke about some of the laws. Um, I spoke about Brussels 2 bis, which is the laws concerning the cross-border um, uh, parental dispute uh, proceedings. Um, I spoke <clears throat> about um, uh, the 
guardianship at, within Europe. Now, the, the um, asylum and trafficking legislation put in place obligations for member states to put in place guardians. Um, for unaccompanied children or trafficked children where, where they may have parents but their interests uh, are in conflict with their parents. Um, those rules are te tend to be comp general um, in their nature. Uh, for example, although there's an obligation to appoint a guardian, um, member states can decide whether guardians are professional guardians or whether your guardians can be essentially volunteer guardians, good citizens who are appointed by the court. So obviously that leads to huge uh, divergences. Um, but over the years, uh, we see these, these the, the incremental progress and uh, an increase in detail in what the EU tries to do. Um, so in the first um, generation, the first uh, asylum laws had very general provisions on guardianship. And now the proposals for um, uh, the revision of those laws are much more detailed. Um, and for example, there's a proposal that there be a maximum number of children that any guardian can act for. Um, because previously you would find that maybe in Italy, it was the mayor of a city that was the guardian for all of the children in the city. Uh, whereas in the Netherlands, there would be a rule that there is a professional guardian dedicated only to this and who has a maximum of 20 cases uh, on his books at any time. Um, the policy area I mentioned, safer internet and investing in children, the EU anti-trafficking strategy, and also the EU's reflection paper on integrated child protection systems. So in the policy area, there really is a lot happening, and it usually has a, a mid to long term uh, time frame. Um, you may have a four year strategy or you may have a 10 year strategy, uh, obviously, depending on the area. Um, and that strategy will influence EU action throughout that period. It will influence policy, uh, funding orientations, where the EU puts its money. Um, and then we spoke about practical measures of support um, and funding. And at the moment, the EU um, justice uh, funding um, instruments, so the instruments that come from uh, the Commissioner for um, uh, Justice, has a big focus on capacity building. Uh, for legal and social professionals. Um, in some cases, that may be joint capacity building, um, which is very helpful in kind of supporting multi-agency work. Um, and I think we can all think about, when we think about the data and research that we engage in, it's also interesting um, not only to look at the issues themselves, but how we respond to those issues. Um, I think the time is very ripe for the Commission to get some recommendations on how a training happens and what's the best way to do training and how to link training initiatives together so that we don't always uh, reinvent the wheel and we can draw from existing training. And uh, again, uh, the Child Protection Hub, <laughs> I think, is a very good example of um, how these things can be done better. Um, now, we talked about what kind of input uh, you, you, you see yourselves in your uh, work um, providing. So where do you bring that um, input? Um, you know, as we said, some of what you do will contribute to raising awareness about issues. Or it may be that you're developing specific recommendations for law or policy. For example, saying that in the case of a trafficked child, one really wants a professional guardian and not a volunteer guardian who may not have specialized knowledge in dealing with these sensitive issues. Um, you may want to promote good practice that you're seeing um, in your country or uh, push for regional projects in a particular field. Um, and the Commission, of course, is an initiator of policy um, and an initiator of law. Uh, they um, regularly publish consultations in policy fields. Um, they're not necessarily very nuanced. It's more of a polling system, but um, where uh, if, if you are engaging in research and if you have um, ideas for how that should influence the regional policy framework, it's good to think about that in your conclusions. And, and of course, many of the reports do that and really focus on your recommendations on particular stakeholders. Um, the council is, of course, essentially uh, 
the body of all the member states when they come to meet. Same for the European Council. The European Council is when the heads of government meet each other. The ordinary council is where the ministers in particular fields meet each other. But of course, in either case, you're basically looking at the governments coming together. So really there, the input uh, you're bringing at national level is to your government, um, is to them to bring it to the table in Brussels or wherever else uh, they are meeting. And the European Parliament is made up of uh, all of the different MEPs. So again, you can target your own particular MEP. Um, I think um, MEPs are, uh, some MEPs are very careful uh, about bringing, making that link between um, uh, their constituents and, and EU action. Um, it's also worth bearing in mind that the European Parliament has connections with national parliaments. So again, also having conversations with your national parliamentarians about what should happen with Brussels may have an impact and also may be um, welcome input to a national MP, a national parliamentarian, because um, then they can be kind of creative about bringing the message uh, forward. Um, I mentioned the courts because, of course, the European Court in Luxembourg is responsible for um, giving interpretation on EU law to national courts when they request it. They also uh, uh, take decisions on infringement proceedings which the Commission might bring against a member state for failure, for example, to implement an EU law at national level. So, um, I mean, NGOs and, and professionals uh, may encounter situations where changing um, law and policy at EU level uh, takes a pathway through the courts, um, through strategic litigation. Um, uh, they may be interested in cases that are working their way up from in, in other countries. And there are a number of kind of legal networks or professional networks where one can track these kinds of issues that are before the court. And of course, a ruling has a very powerful effect. In one case, the UK was taken to court for sending unaccompanied children back to Italy on the basis that and the kids came into Italy in the first place, filed for asylum there and moved on to England. And the UK decided they should go back to Italy and that's where their asylum claim should be heard. Um, and the rules that govern that at EU level uh, did have a provision that the best interests of the child should determine whether or not you can transfer a child back to another country. Um, but they weren't entirely clear. Um, and the court in Luxembourg ruled on the matter and said, that as a general matter you shouldn't transfer children back to the country uh, where they entered um, the EU uh, because um, that might prolong um, the uh, procedure for the child. Um, and then we talked as well about EU agencies um, uh, and the operational practical work they engage in and the fact that you can bring your expertise to them uh, and contribute it directly. So that is, in essence, a whistle-stop tour of uh, child protection in EU internal affairs. I'm going to hand back to Olivia. OK, uh, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, I know that in the poll, uh, most of you uh, are working in an EU member state and therefore the focus on EU internal affairs may be key to you. Uh, but there are some uh, important learnings uh, to draw on uh, from EU external affairs as well. And also some of you may still be working with third countries in alliances or actually uh, supporting third countries in the area of child protection. So I hope that this still will be of interest to you. So, uh, like in uh, EU internal affairs, uh, the EU can take several types of action in EU external affairs, which is directed to third countries, so non-EU members. So the EU, for example, has a mandate to contribute to peace and security by facilitating dialogue, like they did in the case of uh, Kosovo and Serbia. Uh, the EU is the largest single donor of development aid uh, 
and together with the EU member states, also the uh, largest donor of humanitarian aid. Uh, the EU has a strong mandate to defend and promote human rights, and it is a partner to the UN, including, for instance, UNICEF, where it has a special partnership to promote children's rights. And uh, the EU also engages in climate change, and it is the world's uh, largest uh, trading bloc. And I would say that thanks to the very hard work of many different child rights and child protection actors in Brussels and across Europe, uh, child protection has in, let's say, the past five years uh, become a major commitment uh, of the EU across these roles. And there have actually been very far reaching commitments to child protection specifically, and one of the most recent ones you can see here. And in, to ensure that this commitment doesn't just remain a commitment, uh, the EU actually has a number of tools and instruments uh, at its disposal. And these tools, this type of action that the EU can take, provides you as children's rights and child protection advocates with really important opportunities to engage with the EU and a framework for your advocacy. So let's take a little bit closer look at the commitments and the tools that I've just mentioned and how relevant they are to child protection. And on the screen, you can see an extract of the Human Rights Action Plan, uh, which was adopted in July last year. And this commitment here in the Action Plan is likely to generate a lot of opportunities for you to engage with the EU on children's rights more broadly, but also on child uh, protection uh, more specifically. So, what are the opportunities that the commitment, which is further specified in the Human Rights Action Plan, can generate? So, here you see a selection of different types of tools and measures that can be activated by the Action Plan and by the EU. And again, I see these not merely as tools, but they are really important opportunities for you to engage with the EU. They provide you with opportunities to highlight violations against children's rights, to address specific concerns, to promote state action, and to generate funding. And you can engage with the EU in several different ways by sharing data and evidence, uh, making recommendations, engaging in public consultations and civil society dialogue. So if we look a little bit closer at these opportunities, one of the key uh, success that I have experienced in my um, career in the area of uh, child protection are the specific guidelines that relate to children's rights. So we have guidelines on children on conflict, but also guidelines specifically on children's rights, with uh, including a focus on child protection. And these have already generated a lot of action to promote child protection. They have uh, generated specific funding for projects. They have generated political statements uh, from the EU, uh, on children's rights, for instance, early child marriage, and they've also placed uh, children's rights and child protection firmly in the context of uh, political uh, dialogue. So if we look at another specific example, we have the human rights strategy papers, which set out the country's specific human rights uh, priorities and action. And stakeholders can engage with the EU to emphasize the kind of priorities and action that should go into these strategies. 
you can suggest specific action, you can highlight specific children's rights violations so that you influence the content of these papers. And I know that in 2014, children's rights had been prioritized in over 60 of the human rights country strategies globally, often with the focus on uh, child labor, but also on trafficking and uh, child sexual abuse. And uh, in a similar way, you can uh, also influence uh, political dialogue and human rights dialogue by sharing information and highlighting concerns. And certain priority issues like children's rights and women's rights are always on the agenda of each political dialogue and human rights dialogue. So there are concrete opportunities to bring up specific violations or concerns in the context of these dialogues. And in a similar way, you can also uh, influence the progress reports of uh, pre-accession countries. Uh, as you may know, the Commission has to um, report annually the progress that is achieved by countries that are official candidates for uh, EU member states. And we have seen that uh, it can be successful to engage with the EU to ensure that there are uh, that there is a focus on children's rights and child protection issues, but also that there are concrete recommendations uh, coming out from the reports. And there again, you can play an important role in feeding into these reports through both formal and informal consultations. And again, going back to my first presentation, you have to carefully consider uh, what your key messages are and bring concrete advocacy to the table, not just stating problems, but also coming with concrete examples of what may address your specific concerns. And then, uh, last but not least, for, for many of the children's uh, rights organisations, we have uh, EU funding. And here, I think a key message from me is that action that is funded by the EU is always based on policy priorities set out in different policy areas. So influencing policy priorities can often be the best way to generate funding opportunities or influencing the country human rights strategies may be the best way to secure funding in an area that you later can benefit from. So I'd like to take a minute to see if you have ever worked with any of these uh, opportunities. Uh, so I'm going to ask for the poll to come up. Kenya, thank you. Okay. Well, it, it does seem that uh, you do engage in external affairs and that there's quite broad uh, contribution. Yeah. So this is actually interesting because that means that you have identified these as opportunities and taken action to, to influence them. And then, of course, you know and you have probably seen that the link between policy and funding is really important. It keeps changing a little bit here, but it seems that most of you have worked on some form of statements from the EU and also, of course, influenced the, the country strategy papers. So if we move on, thank you very much. So I'd like to continue to talk a little bit about the link between policy and funding, because in my experience, a lot of the children's rights NGOs that do engage in external affairs are mainly interested in uh, the development cooperation aid or the humanitarian aid. And that is, of course, totally okay, but you have to make sure that you also work 
to influence the policy that will provide you opportunities in this area. So if we look at the European Initiative for Democracy and Human Rights that I'm sure most of you, if not all, have heard about, this is the funding tool that helps the EU to implement its human rights commitments in third countries. And they are, as we've seen, set out in the Human Rights Action Plan and the strategies and the country strategy papers. And as you can see here, the EIDHR makes specific reference to promoting children's rights, but also specific uh, child protection issues, including trafficking and uh, child protection. And the calls can either cover uh, country specific priorities or they can be global priorities, for example, economic, social and cultural rights. And when I started to work in, in Brussels, children's rights were not a priority in the context of EIDHR. And, but since then, and the advocacy that was invested in this programme, we have seen a lot of different programmes financing children's rights uh, in third countries. For example, just to mention one uh, project, because there are so many, but just to give you an example, there have been a project to develop child protection measures in collaboration with local governments and preventing child sexual abuse and trafficking in Moldova. But I am sure that you know of many, many more projects that are connected to children's rights and child protection. Another instrument uh, that you may be of, aware of is the European Neighbourhood Funding Instrument, which supports the implementation of the European Neighbourhood Policy. And uh, the funding regulation itself only mentions child labour, but that, as you most probably know, has not prevented funding for a way, wide range of other child protection concerns. And this is mainly because the general policy directions for the European Neighbourhood Policy have generated specific country priorities related to children in the country action plans. So the country action plans will then, based on the policy priorities in this area, set out short or medium term uh, priorities. And these in turn are based on the country reports. So you here already see kind of the trajectory from policy to reports, concrete priorities to funding. And here are some extracts from the Moldova action plan. And they have in turn generated funding from the instrument to develop child protection measures, as I just Said. And I think that this really illustrates the importance of influencing across the both policy directions and country priorities in order to generate funding. And as I said before, you can engage with the EU to influence country reports and action plans through informal dialogue, formal channels such as public civil society consultations, or by producing reports that the EU can take into account. Another uh, uh, important programme that you uh, are aware of is the uh, priority set for enlargement. And they, again, these policy priorities will determine what will be funded under the pre-accession uh, programme. And again, in a similar way, the country strategy uh, papers will influence what is funded. And here you can see extracts, let me see, there, uh, for, uh, from two uh, strategy papers. Uh, and as you can see, the Montenegro one here has, uh, exa for example, generated projects to provide technical support to officials in Montenegro on children in the justice system. And again, there are opportunities for you to influence the progress reports and the strategies. And I know that many organizations do this systematically uh, 
like many of you have shown here, and they have been able to successfully place children's rights and child protection on the agenda. And I'm not sure if you have uh, read or um, seen the explanatory note that we have written on EU internal and external affairs and child protection, uh, but it does look a little bit closer at the opportunities that you can grasp uh, both in enlargement and uh, pre-accession. So before moving on, I would like to understand better who you engage with uh, when you do your advocacy in external affairs. Yes, it seems to be fairly local with national authorities and the EU delegation. You also seem to have quite good relations with the European Commission in Brussels, which is helpful. And some of you also engage with the members of the European Parliament. But actually, national authorities seem to be the, the biggest target group for you. And this is really important uh, to consider who your targets are and how you uh, best will achieve change in external affairs by engaging with different actors. And I think that uh, go local is uh, a really good uh, strategy and then work in alliances to reach actors, for instance, in, in Brussels. So if we move on to my final slide, I'd really like to say a couple of words uh, on the actors, since different actors will play a lead role in different, uh, um, in relation to different instruments and contexts. And again, I think that it's really, really important here, as I said in my first section, not to make assumptions on who has impact or mandate uh, to act. You really have to know your actor. For example, if we take the European Parliament, it can produce opinions on policy directions, and it also produces annual reports on human rights. These you can contribute to. And for those of you here who are in a member state, and I saw that some of you engage with MEPs, I do think that it might be worth investing in dialogue and building relation with the national MEP. As Rebecca said, some of them uh, are very careful and, and uh, promote good action, and they can become important allies for you. And uh, you may also be aware of that there is a European Parliament uh, inter-service group on children's rights, and they organize hearings and debates on uh, issues of concern. And that's also an opportunity to bring issues to the European Parliament that may influence uh, their position on a particular policy issue or a particular uh, piece of legislation in EU internal affairs, namely um, that is of interest to you. Um, not many of you had engaged with the European External Action Service, uh, which is the EU diplomatic service. Um, they are responsible for carrying out the EU's common foreign and security policy and to manage the political relations with third countries. And they are important because they oversee the implementation of the Human Rights Action Plan. And you can engage with the EAS. Uh, I know that we have sometimes been approached with a request for us to bring to their attention specific children's rights violations. And that can generate statements from them or demarches, or they may actually want to uh, insert a particular issue in the agenda of uh, political dialogue. They also sometimes uh, issue uh, public consultations that you might may want to, to contribute to. And 
A few of you said that you engaged with the EU delegations. There are 139 EU delegations around the world. They represent the EU in their uh, country. And they are crucial. And again, I think it's really important to go local uh, when it comes to the EU and external affairs, because so many powers and have been kind of transferred to the EU delegation in relation to political dialogue, administering development aid and overseeing uh, EU trade. So they are really crucial actors in influencing country reports, strategies, and also generating action from the EAS on specific child rights uh, violation. As Rebecca said, uh, the European Commission initiates uh, policy and quite a few had engaged with the EU. It's not clear to me if it's in relation to funding or actually influencing uh, desks uh, that uh, focus on your particular country or if it's more broader uh, policy uh, direction. But it's good to see that, that there are efforts to engage with the Commission because the Commission will be an important ally in introducing specific policy priorities and also uh, raising uh, human rights concerns. And it manages and allocates uh, EU funds. So finding out who does what and when is really crucial if you want to influence the EU. And continuous engagement with the EU actors close to you, such as MEPs or delegations, and keeping, keeping up regular contacts with officials will help you monitor opportunities, ensure that you are at the right moment in time, engaging with the right actor, and it will also enhance your relations and increase your credibility as a partner to the EU in promoting child uh, protection. And I think that is uh, to end my, my key message here. Try and ensure that you engage regularly with the EU. Don't expect that you will have access and impact if you jump in here and there and sporadically. The best strategy for you is to build solid relations with key policy and decision makers throughout the process in your child uh, protection work. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. I hope that it's been helpful as a brief introduction to advocacy in general and then EU advocacy opportunities in EU internal and external affairs. Thank you very much, Andalivi. Um, if uh, any of you have any questions to the speakers, please feel free to use the chat to ask questions. And uh, Olivia and Rebecca, uh, if you have anything to add, uh, please let me know. Otherwise, um, I would like to take an opportunity and to mention that if the participants want to receive certificates of attendance of the webinar, please send us an email to just give me a second, I will give you the email in the chat box. Here it is, to the Child Hub. Also, the recording of this webinar will be available on the website, on the page where you registered. Um, and also next week, the same time, we are going to have a webinar on disappearances of unaccompanied children in Europe. If you are interested in the topic, please register. This is the link to the webinar. And the explanatory note on EU opportunities that um, was mentioned before is also av available on the webinar page. You can find it on the website. Okay, then uh, we will keep the room open for a while. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please use the chat box. And thank you very much to Olivia and Rebecca for the wonderful presentation and for and have a good day.